Uh, today's first award is for the uh, Raymond Lindemann Award, which is intended for a paper that's just been published in the last year or so, and which the, the reviewers feel has, uh, will be transformative. Um, I think it also ends up being an award for people that, that we feel are going to make major contributions to our society over the long sweep of time. And today's awardee, uh, uh, Hillary Close, is certainly in that category. Uh, Hillary's got degrees from uh, Oberlin College, two degrees from Harvard, and she's currently following an, a NOAA postdoc at the University of Hawaii, an assistant researcher at that institution. Um, last night as I was getting ready, I, I, I read her paper, and I'm a lake person, so deep mesopelagic things don't necessarily uh, register with me, but as soon as I read this paper, I went, oh, I can use this, this is really cool. And what she's shown in the study is that <clears throat> it's actually important to try and figure out how uh, pelagic production is exported to deeper depths, and this is true in lakes or, or in uh, deeper oceanic systems. And the novelty to, to Hillary's PNAS paper has to do with how she's worked out how to measure basically invisible sinking particles. Submicron material that, due to Stokes' law, should never make it down into the depths, seems to get there. And how does she know? She used an analysis of lipids that were unique to a size fraction and worked out that these lipids had to come from picoplankton that were up in the water column. And so the novel application of these technologies to, a, to something that physically shouldn't happen has allowed people to readdress this issue of why does there seem to be enough metabolism to produce a lot of production, and yet it doesn't end up physically in the traps. There's so much more to come from this that the readers of the paper felt that, the, that, that it was really likely to transform our understanding of export processes in oceans. So with that, please uh, welcome Hillary Close, the 2015 Raymond Lindemann Award winner. Thank you, Peter. That was an incredibly kind introduction, and I almost feel like I don't have to summarize the paper now. Um, so uh, I'm extremely honored to be here today, uh, especially with such sort of a poignant origin of this award, as well as a long history of um, very esteemed recipients. Um, so I want to thank uh, the ASLO Award Committee and uh, President Elser, as well as the Business Office, for bringing me here. Uh, foremost, my nominator, Liz Canuel, who uh, probably doesn't realize how influential her work has been for me. Uh, today, I call myself a marine water column organic geochemist, <laughs> uh, a lot due to the work of people like Liz, uh, Stuart Wakeham, Cindy Lee, um, John Hedges, among others. So I'm very grateful for this nomination. Um, so I think it's fair to sort of go through a summary of this paper since it's relatively new. I'll try to do it fairly quickly though. Um, so this was work I did during my PhD at Harvard. So a brief history of the project, here's the title, the authors. Uh, the teams were centered at Harvard, led by Ann Pearson, my PhD advisor, and at Scripps by Lahini Aluhari. And uh, this started way back in about 2004, so um, most of these people have moved on to bigger and different things and very far-flung places. Um, so I just want to acknowledge all these co-authors. There were a lot of pieces to this puzzle, um, which I will describe in turn. So the original idea was simply to isolate geochemical signatures of prokaryotes um, in a prokaryotically dominated system of the North Pacific subtropical tropical gyre. Um, and in order to do that, they sort of had to do some very extraordinary approaches. Um, and by extraordinary, I partially mean a bit of a pain in the butt, but totally worth it for the results you get. Um, so the first was to filter eukaryote-free seawater. So excluding the smallest eukaryotes means pre-filtering down at 0.5 microns, uh, because there are some eukaryotes that small. So by isolating a size class that's purely prokaryotic at 0.2 to 0.5 microns, uh, we termed this in this paper uh, XPOM, which is simply for extra small particulate organic matter. It could have been a different acronym, but most of the other ones we wanted were taken. Um, so it might stick, we'll see. 
Um, the other extraordinary thing that we did was collected enough bi biomass to make natural abundance compound-specific radiocarbon measurements on individual prokaryotic biomarkers. Um, so this kind of approach actually requires up to 50 to 100,000 liters of water filtered. And there is a place you can do this on the Big Island of Hawaii where um, deep sea water is brought up through pipes um, and you can filter on shore. So we have a mesopelagic sample and a surface sample that went into these studies. Um, so this compound-specific approach, I want to highlight this is really an organic geochemical approach rather than a purely biological one. In organic geochemistry, we isolate compounds of different lability and of different biological specificity in order to examine both the origins and the detrital fate of biomass. So it's thinking about it more in an organic matter cycling perspective than purely a biological one. So the compound classes that this set of papers looked at were first archaeolipids, which are clearly specific to archaea, but can actually exist in both living cells and in detrital biomass. Um, so that I will refer to in uh, the following figures uh, with the letter A. The next paper looked at bacterial DNA. DNA is very labile, so we can assume that it comes only from living cells and it is specific to bacteria. And finally, this paper looked at fatty acids, which are ubiqui ubiquitously produced in both bacteria and eukaryotes, and they are um, present in both detrital and living cells. So they're a more integrative picture of organic matter. So we're sort of narrowing in on different parts of the metabolism and detrital pool here. So why radiocarbon? This figure gives us um, kind of a nice illustration of why this is a great tool. Um, so this is a profile of, let's see where my pointer is, <laughs> dissolved inorganic carbon, DIC, and DOC in the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre. And you can see that the uh, values change quite ex uh, extremely with depth. So you can imagine that a, uh, an autotrophic organism in the surface ocean is assimilating in situ DIC, will have a very different radiocarbon composition in its biomass than one that is chemotrophic, assimilating in situ DIC in the mesopelagic ocean. And then when we think about POC, this is produced in the surface ocean that has that modern radiocarbon value from exchange with the atmosphere, but it's going to retain it because it's sinking much more quickly through the water column compared to the residence time of these other pools. So if we're looking at the depths that we've sampled here in the red boxes, you can see that investigating mesopelagic metabolisms, we now have a really good way to separate between metabolisms that are chemoautotrophic, metabolisms that are heterotrophic, feeding on sinking particulate mat organic matter, and the possible metabolism that would um, utilize the bulk DOC pool. So I'm just gonna flip through the results really quickly of these three papers in turn. The archaeolipid paper, um, the surface archaeolipids, of course have a modern composition, uh, which is to be expected. The mesopelagic, which this is a complete unknown at the time, actually fell between the line of chemoautotrophy and heterotrophy on uh, modern POC. So Anitra and Sunni in their paper uh, calculated the mixing line between these, which also included a detrital component. So this is the paper, and these are the brief results. The one that I'm highlighting here is the bottom one. They found that 14% of those archaeolipids were actually detritally derived from surface material. Uh, you should definitely read the rest of this paper for the um, other good conclusions. Moving on to bacterial DNA, again, surface modern, not a surprise. Completely untested, again, a mesopelagic ocean. Surprisingly, bacteria are a large percentage chemoautotrophic. Um, so this helps us narrow down uh, an end member, especially for DNA. And that is Roberta's paper. You should also check that out. Moving on to the fatty acid data presented in this paper, remember bacterial and eukaryotic origins. Surface, again, modern. But actually, our mesopelagic sample also looks uh, around modern, so there is some scatter around it in both the data and the error. 
So we really need to narrow in with some more measurements to get an idea of where this could derive from. Remember that we have sampled two populations of particles in the surface ocean. Uh, the large, both the large pool and the small pool are going to include a detrital component, which is sort of the blob, and um, heterotrophic, the red components, and uh, primary producers in the green. And then by some pathways, um, it might be possible that any of these components could sink and contribute to this deep sample, which would include detrital material sinking from above, as well as, of course, in situ heterotrophs and this black I've uh, put for potential chemoautotrophs. Um, so I'm going to look at the fatty acid profiles of these first. Uh, so these are chromatograms somewhere showing the fatty acid profiles. And just very quickly, I want to note that the surface XPOM or small fraction that looks almost identical to this deep fraction in the fatty acid profile, and they're very dissimilar from the large particles. And we also have here stable isotope delta C13 values. Again, the small surface particles and the deep particles are very similar and different from the large particles in the surface ocean. So if I put together a mixing model, assuming that this deep sample has to be some composition of detrital material from these two pools and in situ contribution, I can plot this on a ternary diagram, uh, where each of the vertices is the 100% uh, composition of the end members. And I'll just flip through the different lines of evidence we used. Those fatty acid profiles themselves really limit the amount of large particles that could be contributing to the deep uh, sample. Uh, Roberta's uh, bacterial DNA here is obviously much uh, uh, more negative delta radiocarbon values than the fatty acids, but there is still some possibility of a contribution, so that narrows the solution field down to um, a large portion of surface sinking, but still some in situ. And then finally, the delta C13 values of those fatty acids further limit the amount of possible contribution from surface large particles. So now we have a small solution space that mostly includes surface small particles and in situ production. And then I compared this uh, to sort of an independent prediction based on uh, Anitra and Suni's archaeal uh, lipid results, that 14% sinking fraction, and then using uh, cell abundances measured by Carner et al. 2001 of archaea versus bacteria. This is assuming that they have similar export potential because they have similar uh, cell sizes. And in short, the solution fields are compatible, so that's nice. So the results here, um, sort of in a very quick summary, this was our summary figure, um, leaving a wide error range, uh, sinking XPOM, that's the small submicron fraction, uh, contributes greater than 50% of deep mesopelagic fatty acids. And this is actually consistent with some models. This is not a new idea, um, but it is some uh, actual data that is consistent with these models that predict that exported biomass should actually be proportional to its occurrence in the surface ocean. Since we're in a microbially dominated regime, this actually makes sense. And then finally, we leave the sinking mechanism open. We had no way of measuring this, but a lot of people probably in this room have evidence of different pathways that um, small particles, that Pachlorococcus, bacterial autotrophs, can be included into aggregates or into the guts of um, swimmers, mesoplankton, et cetera. So some implications. Uh, this is just a very simple schematic of the long-standing microbial loop model. Um, you'll see that I've sort of put two uh, populations of primary producers in the surface ocean, large and small. The microbial loop model would say that the small um, phytoplankton are effectively remineralized in the surface ocean, so they do not contribute to export. Export is completely controlled by larger cells. And I just wanted to point out that there's plenty of evidence that there can also be an isotopic distinction between these two starting populations which would lead to isotopic sorting of the recycled versus the exported pools. Um, so that uh, in, impacts our interpretation of isotope values that we see in the deep sea. Uh, in contrast, uh, these results and other compatible results that say that picoplankton or submicron biomass can actually be exported, now we have more pathways to get biomass down to the deep sea through aggregation processes or grazing. Um, 
And now it sort of leads to a lot more ambiguity because, again, we might have isotopic distinctions within our original pools, but because of these different pathways, um, it might be unclear how to interpret what we see in the deep ocean, especially in um, suspended versus sinking pools. So it leads to a lot of unknowns, and I would argue that it also complicates uh, mass balance calculations of export based on isotopes. Another uh, implication is that in future warming climates, the proportion of small cells is predicted to increase. Um, so uh, previous estimates have been that that would lead to less carbon sequestration and more uh, respiration in the surface ocean, but this would um, contradict that conclusion. There's also implications for ancient oceans, of course, because uh, in early Earth there were more microbially dominated oceans. Um, I've actually published this, this study came early in my graduate career, so it influenced a lot of my later work, and I've published a paper on the proterozoic microbial food web um, using isotope dynamics like this. Um, and NASA has also funded us, so it's, there's actually some interest in this from them as well. Um, so if I have time, I'm just going to go through a little bit of more general um, thoughts on XPOM and particulate organic matter in general. Uh, you might think that this slice that we measured, 0.2 to 0.5 microns, was awfully small to be contributing such a large component of deep POM. Um, but I want to point out that this is actually falling on, of course, the particle size continuum. So this is a nice figure from Azam and Amal Fadi. And it shows the, um, so we have larger particles on the left, smaller particles down to colloids and dissolved organic matter on the right, the size range of typical phytoplankton and bacteria. And of course, molecular techniques and ultrafiltration techniques are going to um, capture as many cells as possible. So they're going to capture basically that whole range of phytoplankton and bacterial cells. However, typical chemical oceanography uh, oceanographic techniques um, leave a lot of that out, and that's partially just because of um, an operational definition and because of the type of filters that we have to use. Um, so sometimes they include larger particles, sometimes not, but the idea of XPOM that we've developed in this paper and subsequent papers is really designed to spread that gap between typical chemical oceanography, which has its reasons for those types of measurements, and the biological realities that we're trying to capture. Um, so one more point here, though, is the isotopic distinction that we saw. This was just a distinction. It didn't have to be um, specific to exactly that size class. You can imagine um, a situation in which that minus 19 per mil in delta C13 that we saw in the small size fraction actually represents a larger part of the pool, maybe all bacteria. Um, so now mass balance arguments uh, become a little bit more reasonable. Um, just a thought. <laughs> so we're capturing a difference with this kind of measurement. So I'm just going <laughs> to say a couple more things because I'm running out of time. Um, it's worth thinking about XPOM and capturing that biological component we might be missing. Um, I've done a lot of work on this in the past few years. I have some results published on lipids, and my citation is there, and I've been working on amino acids recently. Um, and I can tell you, amino acids are about 15 to 20 percent in XPOM versus larger size classes, so it's a pretty big component. And Nietzsche Ingalls has also been working on this. If you're looking at archaeolipids, especially trying to get intact lipids, you need to be going down to 0.2 microns. Um, there's still plenty of sampling and analytical challenges. I'd love to talk with anybody who's interested about these. And then finally, a little plug for Natural Abundance Radiocarbon. It's an amazing tool. It has a lot of potential for this reason. Once you get deep enough in the water column, you can distinguish these different um, sources of carbon, and you can really investigate metabolisms that are otherwise um, very difficult to define but it's very hard to get the time and the funding to get samples that are appropriate for this type of measurement. So this is a plug. I'd like to see more of it in the future, especially if you want to do good science, you need to have replicable science. So I would love for this study itself to be replicated in the future. 
So thank you, and this is acknowledging sort of everybody who went into this paper, our funding, and my current collaborators and funding, and thank you very much.